Hi, my name is Jana. I'm a nurse at Natividad Medical Center and my nurse side is still very concerned and worried and scared with everything that's going on. All the unknowns around COVID-19, all the shortages that are well known and the guidelines changing not to accommodate virus, uh, but to accommodate shortages. And my biggest concern personally is to be exposed at work and bring the virus home to my family and kids. So the other day we had, uh, me and God, we had this moment that I call my Esther moment with God because he made me realize that for a patient who is in isolation, my position as a nurse is actually a privileged position to be there, uh, the few, healthcare workers that are allowed in to bring a word of comfort, to be present as a godly presence for the person and to bring Jesus into the person's life. From that moment on, it's as if God had taken the weight off of me to be exposed and all, the, all my worries. It's like God took that away from me and then made me see from this new perspective, he has a plan for that person and I could be the last one able to bring Jesus into the person's life. So I put myself as an instrument in God's hands from that moment on, because I understand that as a healthcare worker, as a Christian, I could be it. It's like I could be the last one to go in and talk about Jesus before the person goes to a state that they cannot decide anything. So it made me feel um, really an instrument of God at that moment. Well, today we continue our series in the book of Daniel, and we're talking about standing strong when things look impossible. And like I said last week, uh, we, we, we prepared these sermons, we knew the sermon titles, the biblical text, the direction we were going in, in June of 2019, but I just have this deep, deep sense that the Holy Spirit is going to be speaking through this series, was preparing us even then for what's happening right now. And, and I want to think for a minute about some of those things that we at times kind of envision as impossible. There may be things going through your mind right now, that, 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 things like this. It's impossible that our economy is going to ever fully recover. Uh, it's impossible that I, it's just not even possible that I'm going to find uh, the right job after this whole thing's done, or, or, or I, I'm not going to go back to the same job, or uh, boy, it's, it's, um, uh, we'll never see the church full of people worshiping together again. Now, that's over. It's impossible that that'll ever happen again. I'll never get to watch another live sporting event the rest of my life. It's impossible. I don't know what it is that starts to go through your mind, but the more that we focus on and dwell on that which we, we think seems impossible, I think the more we start to, to believe that those things aren't going to happen. And so we have to be honest and real about where our world is at, but there's some things that appear impossible, but are absolutely possible with the power and the presence of God. And that's what we're thinking about today as we look at Daniel chapter 2. And so I'm going to walk you through a series of scenes that unfold in Daniel chapter 2. Hopefully you've been reading each week and you've been, you've been going through the last two weeks so you've gone through the book of Daniel twice, at least the first seven chapters. But we're going to look at chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. And this first scene is what I call an impossible request with radical consequences. It's a seemingly impossible request that's made with incredibly radical consequences. So start with me in Daniel chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled and he could not sleep. So the king summoned the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. Now, just to hit the pause button for a moment there, uh, the, the king, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, had all of these people that were kind of part of his cabinet. There were magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, astrologers, counselors, wise men, but they were all kind of lumped together as his cabinet, his advisors of different sorts. And so he called some of those folks in to tell him what he had dreamed. When they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I have, had, <clears throat> I have had a dream that troubles me, and I want to know what it means. 
Then the astrologers answered the king, may the king live forever, because that's how you answered kings in the ancient world. May the king live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will interpret it. The king replied to the astrologers, this is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces and your houses turned into piles of rubble. Not a pleasant thought, not a kind thing to say, but he meant it. All right? But if you tell me the dream and explain it, you will receive gifts from me and rewards and great honor. So tell me the dream and interpret it. Do you get a sense of what's happening here? You get the picture? Nebuchadnezzar is saying, I want you to interpret my dream, but I don't totally trust you. I think you may be making stuff up. So for me to know that you really have the ability to interpret the dream, I'm going to make you tell me what I dreamed, and I haven't told anybody what it was. So if you can tell me what I dreamed, I believe you could tell me what the dream means. So, so you get the point there, right? And, and this is a bunch of his counselors, his cabinet, and he gives us what, what I call an impossible request, <clears throat> impossible for humanly speaking, with radical repercussions. Do this or you're dead and your, your house goes into ruins. So the story continues in verse 7. Once more they replied, let the king tell his servants the dream and we will interpret it. Then the king answered, I am certain that you are trying to gain time. You're, you're buying time right now because you realize that this is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me the dream, there is only one penalty for you. You have conspired to tell me misleading and wicked things, hoping the situations will change. So then tell me the dream, and I will know that you can interpret it for me. So you get a sense of what's going on here. The king has played this game with his advisors, his counselors, his wise men, his magicians, this whole group of people. In the past, He's said, interpret my dream, and you get the sense they've interpreted it, and it didn't turn out the way they said, but they're like, well, just wait a little longer, and wait. And if you wait long enough for almost any kind of vague interpretation, something can happen, and go, oh, there it is, there it is. And so the king's kind of on to them. He's realizing they don't have these special powers to interpret dreams. He doesn't really trust them. So he, he's telling them, you, so here's the deal. You have to tell me my dream and interpret it, and you'll get, I'll lavish you with gifts. But if you can't do that, severe life and death consequences. So let's pick up the story in verse 10. The astrologers answered the king, there is no one on earth who can do what the king asks. No king, however great and mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or astrologer. What the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal to the king except the gods, and they do not live among humans. So what they're saying is, King, this is unfair. This is impossible. It can't be done. It's not possible. So they, they are fearful because they know the king's temperament. They know that he means it when he says it could cost them their lives and tearing down their home probably with their family in it. I mean, he's, the king is outraged. And, and the king, you'll notice as you read through here, has, has, an ang has anger issues. He should get a little help, get a little counseling, but you didn't tell the king that. You just kind of tried to work with him, right? And so, so they, they knew his temperament, and they were right about something. They said, no human being can do This is impossible for a human being. But what they didn't realize, because they were, they were worshiping false gods who didn't exist, that there is a God in heaven who can speak through people, and that's what they're going to learn. So the next scene is what I call impending doom. This is the impending doom. Look with me at Daniel chapter 2, verse 12. This made the king so angry. I mean, he was mad before, but it made him so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men of Babylon. So he just takes every person who is an enchanter or a sorcerer or a wise man, an advisor, everybody on his council, everyone on his leadership team, everyone on his board, everyone who gave him advice. And he said, everyone dies. And he meant it. So, difficult, uh, difficult situation. But, but the, and, and here's a twist we have to understand. At this point, Daniel and Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, that, that, was their, that was their Jewish names, but Daniel and his three friends were now sort of on the king's council. They were his wise men. They were part of his advisors, which means they were going to die along with everybody else. 
So now the next scene. I call this an impossible situation. Quotes, impossible, seemingly impossible situation. So the decree was issued to put the wise men to death. And men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. A group is sent out to find Daniel and his friends and have them executed. So here's the turning point, all right? This is Daniel chapter 2, verses 14 to 23. I call this scene how the impossible became possible. How do things change? And I want you to notice and just pay attention to what happens here because there's all kinds of lessons that grow out of this passage. So just pay attention, follow along in your Bibles, beginning in verse 14 of Daniel chapter 2. When Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. He asked the king's officer, why did the king, why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Arioch then explained the matter to Daniel. At this, Daniel went to the king and asked for time so that he might interpret the dream for him, which is really what the king wanted. Then Daniel returned to his house. Another wise thing, watch this. Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven. He says, prayer meeting, prayer time. Let's talk to God about this concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven and said, and he breaks into this spontaneous praise, praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. His, he gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells with him. I thank and praise you, God of my ancestors. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we asked of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. I love Daniel's response. God does this miracle through Daniel, this gifting he has to understand dreams, and, and God gives him the, the, the dream and the answer and, and the interpretation, but he immediately says, to God be the glory. What a great heart. What a great spirit. So, some lessons that we can learn here. How the seemingly impossible becomes possible. So here's the scene where it looked impossible, and when the scene begins, uh, they're coming to kill Daniel and his friends. When the scene ends, Daniel's talked to the king, he's gotten time, and, 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 he, and, and he gets the interpretation of the dream and the dream itself. So, so here's some, I think we can glean some lessons, especially in the season of our lives where we're bumping, to, we're watching things happening in our culture and our world, and we're saying, man, that's never going to happen again. Well, that's going to be a problem. And we can, our minds can just be filled with all the impossibilities of what's next. And are there things we can stop and say, wait a minute, when I'm personally facing something that seems insurmountable, when my family's facing something that seems like we can't get through it, when the church is going through something where we're saying, man, this hurdle's too big. We have to remember the God that we worship, the God who made us, the God who loves us. He is a God who makes what seems impossible to us possible by his power. And there's things we can do to walk in his ways. Here's some lessons. Number one, keep a cool head. Have wisdom and tact. I love this. When they come to Daniel, we read in verse 14, when Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. You just, you just kind of get this cool spirit. Someone comes to kill you, the response isn't, well, you know, can we chat about this? It, most of you, it's just to freak out. Well, oh my gosh, to be terrified. He stops. And in the midst of this storm of a moment, he's got tact. He's got wisdom. He's got kind of a cool spirit about him. And, and that's something we've got to learn to do. And this is not a time in our, in, our, in our country, in our culture, in the church to run around and go crazy. It's the time to kind of slow down, to cool down, and to say, God, give me wisdom, and God, me, guard my words, give me tact. And, and, and so, so right here in this season, you know, we need to slow down a little bit. So here's a question for you. Where are you losing it, and how can you cool down? How can you take, just to take a deep breath? Don't make a quick, big decision. Don't jump into some other thing. I say, Lord, just give me, <laughs> give me wisdom, give me tact, help me settle down, help me cool down. That kind of an attitude and tone 
can make what seems impossible start to seem possible. Here's the next thing. How the seemingly impossible becomes possible. Number two, ask good questions. Ask good questions. Daniel says, why did the king issue such a harsh decree? See, he doesn't even know. All he knows is guards are coming to kill him. And instead of freaking out, he he asks a really good question. Why? What's going on? Man, this is a time right now to ask good questions. To say, how do we, instead instead of panicking, instead of running for the door, to stop and say, what's going on? How do we overcome this? Are there new ways to move forward? I'm going to share with you uh, not what we're going to be doing as a church, but a conversation that's going on right now. We're looking at Shoreline and we're saying, at some point down the line, the, the, the state and the federal government are going to start to say, hey, we're going to reopen the economy. We're going to start, let people start gathering again. And so here's one of the questions we've asked. What if they say, okay, groups can start meeting now, but no more than 100? Because going the other way, when things were shutting down, it was no super large groups, and it was no groups of 100, and it got smaller and smaller. We're, we don't know what they're going to say, but what if they said, okay, we're opening up to where groups of 100 could meet? Well, churches around Monterey can start meeting again because most churches are under 100 people, but Shoreline's not. So we've actually stopped and asked this question. What do we do if for a month or two, they say groups of 100 or less can gather? Now, I can't give you the answer to that question yet, but I can tell you we're asking the question. Instead of panicking and freaking out, we're asking the question. And we're coming up with lots of answers. I'll, I'm not telling you any of these things are going to happen. But we're saying, well, what if we said people could sign up for a church service, have it here in the worship center, spread people out, and have less than 100 people, and have six or seven services? Maybe. What if we did an outdoor service with 100 people? People brought their beach chairs and stuff. We did an outdoor service. And if cars came late, they could park in the upper parking lot and open their windows and listen. But they wouldn't be. Maybe. Maybe we do some groups in homes, some smaller groups in homes where, where they're less than 100. Maybe. But, but here's the point. Instead of panicking, we're looking at the situation and saying, okay, let's ask good questions. What would we do if only 100 people could meet? And you know what? There's dozens of ways we could meet that might be super fun and creative. And we might look back in six months or a year and say, wasn't it great? When we had 2,000 people meet in 20 different gatherings or in 40 different gatherings? I don't know. But we're asking the questions. Instead of panicking and running, we're facing them. We're asking questions. That's what you do when something seems impossible. You don't give up. You don't quit. You ask the right questions. You come up with good solutions. And you press forward. How does this seemingly impossible become possible? Here's another thing. Respond with wisdom. Respond with wisdom. Verse 16, we read this. At this, Daniel went to the king and asked for time so that he might interpret the dream for him. So Daniel says, Daniel says hey, can I have some time? That's a great move. That's wisdom. He, because he didn't know. He didn't know the dream at this moment. He didn't know the interpretation. But he had the wisdom to say, hey, can we just slow this train down a little bit? And you know what? One, one of the wisest things you can do in a time of turmoil, in a time of questions and uncertainty that we're in right now, is slow the truck down. Get off the gas a little bit kind of, and just say, let's stop. Let's look. Let's reflect. This last Monday, I experienced the turmoil and the problem of rushing. And it was no fun. Here's what happened this last Monday. You, most of you know that on Monday and Wednesday and Friday, I do a devotional. And so... But this is a new thing. It's a new video devotional thing. It's a new thing we're doing. So Monday came around, and I hadn't thought about doing a devotional, and nobody else had thought about me doing a devotional. So about the middle of the day, I had the whole day planned and scheduled and a lot of things that I needed to do that were all a lot of shoreline work stuff. And I was going to spend three and a half hours working on sermons four, five, and six in this series, getting working ahead. So I had my day all planned, and I get a note, an email that says, we've got to get you in to film some different things for the church. And my whole day was kind of planned. So I'm like, okay, okay, yeah, it needs to happen. It's Monday, I need, to have, I need to get my devotional videos. So I sit down at my desk and I write the devotional and I do some other things. I have a bunch of stuff all written out, all ready to go. And I'm gonna come over to the church. I'm, I'm sheltering at home, but I'm gonna come to the church to film. Then I go back home again. So I get in my car, I buzz over to the church here. It's about, a, it's about a 14 minute drive for me. I get in here and I'm getting ready to go. And I say, okay, all my notes, all my materials for the videos that I was supposed to do were left at home. Why? Because I'm rushing around. 
I'm a big advanced planner. I don't like to rush. I like to think ahead, know what my schedule. And so now we're throwing new things into my day. I'm not planning well. I'm rushing. And in rushing, I leave all my materials at home. So I say to the team here, I say, hey, listen, I left my stuff at home. I'm going to buzz back home, get my stuff. So I get in my car, zip back home. Uh, my, I leave, I, my, my car is a Prius, which means I have one of the keys that you don't put in. It's just the key that just sits there. So I have my keys to the house on my key ring. So I leave the car running. I rush into the house. You're probably ahead of me on this. I rush into the house. I get my stuff. I rush back into my car. I get in my car, close the garage, and I drive safely and calmly back to Shoreline. And when I get in front of the church and I park on Garden Road, I hit the button to turn my car off, and I reach over next to me to grab my keys. And my keys aren't where they always are when I drive. And so I check in the cup holders, and thought, well, I gotta have my keys with me because the car's running, but I turn off. So I hit the button to start the car, and it says no key set. It doesn't sense any key nearby. So now my rushing has got me to leave my notes, they had to go back and get. Now I don't know where my keys are. So I come in, I film all my stuff, but then I need to get back home to find my keys, and I don't have a car. So fortunately, there was someone at Shoreline, so I said, Can I borrow your car to drive home to get my keys? and then come back here and give you your car and get my car so I can go home. Everybody following me? This is all because I'm rushing instead of dialing back, slow and cool my jets and you know, slowing down. So I drive back to my house and I'm thinking, I bet you I left the keys in the garage door to the house, from in the garage into the house. So I open the garage door, I get out of the car I borrowed, push the buttons, open the garage door, and I look thinking the keys are going to be hanging right in the, in, the, in, the, in the knob, but they're not. So I'm thinking, well, that means I left him in the house. I go to open the door to the house. It's locked. So now I know, okay, wait. I locked the door, which means I had the keys. So I think, well, maybe in my hurry, in my rush, I put him on top of the car and drove off, and maybe they fell in the driveway or in the grass. So I'm looking around the driveway. I'm looking around the grass. I can't find them. So now I'm thinking, well, maybe, I, maybe they were in my car, and I'm going to drive back to the church and look for them. Is everybody following? Is everybody getting this? <laughs> So I get in my car and I start driving back to the church. And as I turn out of my, where I live and start driving down the road, I think to myself, what if I, on my way, one of those times I stopped at my mailbox. What if I opened my mailbox and left the keys in the mailbox? And so I go back, but there's no keys in the mailbox. And then I think, what if I left the keys in the mailbox and somebody saw them and they took them and put them on my porch? So I drive back up to my house. And I park the car, making sure I keep the keys with me because I've already lost one set of keys. I walk up my walkway, look on the porch. There's no keys there. And I look up and there's this little wreath that Sherry has hanging on the door. And sitting on top of the wreath is my keys. <laughs> so apparently I left them in the mailbox and somebody went and put them there. So I went and got back in the car, drove back to the office, returned the keys, got my car, drove home. End of story. Here's the point. My whole day got all flipped upside and down. Because I'm rushing around and not thinking things through. And sometimes we just need to slow things down. And Daniel says to the king, can I have some time? And the king says, sure. Why? Because he wants the dream interpreted. And we need to learn in this season, sometimes, sometimes we just start rushing and moving too quickly. And we go from mistake to mistake and problem to problem. So maybe it's time just to slow down a little bit and learn from the wisdom of Daniel. How the seemingly impossible becomes possible. Here's the fourth thing. Cry out to God. I mean, go to God and cry out to God. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven. He said, brothers, let's pray. We need to pray. And can I tell you, we need to pray right now. When When you're feeling it, Call a few people. Can we pray? Will you pray with me? Will you pray for me? I was talking with somebody, a Shoreline member today. I've been trying to get a hold of him for a couple days. He called me back, and we had a great time talking, and, and, and he's going through some stuff with his business and right now and finances and the economy and challenges there, and we shared, and he asked, how, how's the church doing? And we talked, and at the end of the time, I said to him, I said, hey, let's pray together. I said, and this, you know, I just said, I said let's, let's pray together. And he said, uh, he said, okay, okay. And I, I said, well, I said, I'll pray for you and you pray for me. He said, okay. I said, well, you go first. 
So it's just kind of quiet for a minute. And I said, I said, are you going to pray? He goes, he said, out loud? I said, I said, yeah, I want to agree with your prayer. He says, oh, I'm not, I'm not real big on praying out loud. I said, I, said I, I want your prayers. I need your prayers. Pray for me. And he prayed one of the most beautiful, passionate prayers. And, and I prayed for him. And when it was done, I said, I said, thank you. I said, I need to ask you to pray for me more. I said, that was a beautiful prayer. We got to pray together. Even if it makes you uncomfortable, even if that's not your thing. We pray together because it was out of prayer that God gave the answer. And so I want to challenge you, pray more with people in the season than you ever have before. How the seemingly impossible becomes possible. Number five, expect God to show up and be glorified. Expect it. Anticipate it. Believe that God is going to show up because when Daniel prayed, God not only gave him the answer, not only gave him the interpretation of the dream, God showed him what the dream was, and it was a complex dream. But God showed him because he asked, and he, would. he expected God to show up, and God showed up. Here's my question. Are you expecting God to show up in your life? Are you anticipating God's presence in your home, God's wisdom in your life, God's direction for your future, God's deliverance from your fear? Are you expecting God to show up? You should Because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he's shown up before for you. I know he has. Trust him to be that same God for you today. Well, what I want to look at now is what I call the rest of the story, to see how the rest of this kind of pans out. And it's absolutely fascinating. And so if you have your Bibles with you, you can open them or your Bible app to Daniel 2, and we're going to start in verse 24. If you don't have your Bible with you, that's okay, but it won't be on the screen. Just listen as I tell the story and watch how this unfolds. Then Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to execute the wise men of Babylon, and said to him, do not execute the wise men of Babylon. That probably made him very popular in the long run, right? Take me to the king, and I will interpret his dream for him. Arioch took Daniel to the king at at once and said, I have found a man among the exiles from Judah who can tell the king what his dream means. The king asked Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? He says, can you actually tell me both the dream and the interpretation? Because then I'll know you can tell me what the interpretation really means. Daniel replied, no wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner, no one in your cabinet, can explain to you the king the mystery he has asked about. Which seems like a a, a bad thing to say because the king wants to know an interpretation. But listen to what he says next. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come. This is a prophetic dream of what's coming up. Your dream and the visions that pass through your mind as you were laying in bed are these. As your majesty was lying there, your mind turned to things to come, and the revealer of mysteries showed you what is going to happen. As for me, this mystery has been revealed to me not because I, am, I have greater wisdom than anyone else alive, but so that your majesty may know the interpretation and that you may understand what went through your mind. Your majesty looked, and there before you stood a large statue. So now watch now. He's going to give them the exact dream to the detail all right your majesty looked in your dream and there before you in this dream stood a large statue an enormous dazzling statue awesome in appearance the head of the statue was made of pure gold its chest and arms were made of silver its belly and thighs of bronze its legs of iron its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay while you were watching A rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of clay, of iron and clay, and smashed them. Then the iron and the clay, the bronze, the silver, the gold were all broken to pieces. This entire statue shatters and falls to the ground and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. And the wind swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. Now, he goes on to interpret it. And I'm going to leave the interpretation reading to you. So if you're not doing your daily reading, you'll jump in today and start here and read this. And I hopefully get pulled into the reading. But, but what, what Daniel says to him is basically, he says, listen, this statue is a picture of a series of kingdoms to come. And the, the top kingdom, the biggest kingdom, the kingdom made of gold, that's you and your kingdom. But what he says is, his, he says, your kingdom's going to fall. 
And the kingdom after you is going to fall. And the kingdom after you is going to fall. And the kingdom after you, each of these is a picture of different successive kingdoms. And he basically says they're all going to fall. And this rock that comes and shatters them all is the kingdom of God. The picture is this. Every human kingdom will someday crumble. That's as true today as it was back then. There's one kingdom that lasts forever and ever, and that is the kingdom of the living God. And, 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 and so Daniel not only tells him in minute detail the dream, but he gives an interpretation of the dream and explains what it means. And so I want to make just a few highlights as we're closing and encourage you to dig into and read each chapter of Daniel and let God speak to your heart. But just a couple of insights. There's first what I call a beautiful twist. In, in Daniel 2, 27 and 28, Daniel replied, no wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. There's moments where we just have to say, you know what? I can't do it. I don't know. From a human standpoint, it's not possible. But the God I know, he can do it. How is it that you forgave that person who wronged you so badly? And you say, it wasn't in my strength. I don't have the ability to let those things go. But there is a God in heaven who I worship who gives me power to do that. I know a musician who, who um, was so shy as he was growing up, he'd never want to stand in front of anybody. Terrified. But when he felt like God could use his gifts of music for others, he pushed past the fears. Impossible. No possible with God. I could, tell, I could spend 10 hours right now telling you story after story after story of people I've seen who would say, for me it was impossible, but God in me, it's possible. And you could tell your stories also. God makes the impossible possible. When we were, that's the twist. It's, it's not our power and strength, it's God in us. Another little thing is, as we kind of wrap up this, this second chapter of Daniel. Give God glory every step of the way. I love how he says in verse 30, as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me not because I'm greater, I have greater wisdom than anyone else alive. Daniel says, I'm not that smart. I don't have greater wisdom. This is a gift that God has given to me. He gets the glory. I love that. We've got to give God the glory again and again and again. And then, uh, I think one of the key lessons of the whole book of Daniel is that God wins. And by the way, you are not God. Nebuchadnezzar, God wins. You're not God. You're the head of gold. That's nice. But that comes crumbling down and gets blown away and the kingdom of God lasts forever. And you know what? God wins and I'm not God. And God wins and none of us are God. Only God is God. So listen to how this ends in verses 44 and 45. In the time of those kings, and, and this, this is now Daniel. He's, given, he's told what the dream is. Now he's interpreting it. So this is part of the interpretation of the dream. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain, not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. And remember, Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom was the head of gold. In Daniel's interpretation, he says, King, here's what you dreamed, and here's what it means. And part of what it means is the God of all heaven, the God of all things, will come and crush every other kingdom and set up his kingdom to last forever and ever. How would Nebuchadnezzar respond to that? Read it in Daniel chapter 2. There's so much in this chapter. Dig into God's word. But for you and for me, last question. What is your next step to walk into God's will for your life, even when it seems impossible. What's your next step? Maybe you say, I gotta, I gotta have more of a cool head. I gotta just kind of calm, I gotta cool my jets. I gotta settle down a little bit. That might be your takeaway, is I need to settle down and just whew, take a deep breath. Maybe it's, I gotta ask good questions. I gotta be strategic and think, what are the right questions to ask about my family, about my health, about my life, about my future, about my Ask good questions and seek godly answers to those. Seek God's wisdom. Respond with spiritual wisdom. Make the right plan and execute that plan and move into that plan after you've asked great questions. Cry out to God. Maybe your thing is, I'm not getting people around me to pray enough, and right now with what's going on in my life, I better have three, four, or five close friends praying for me. 
And maybe you're going to have a friend you talk to who says, well, I don't know if I really do that out loud prayer thing. And maybe you say to them, you know what? I need you to pray for me. Will you pray right now? And you start a whole new relationship of praying out loud together with friends who love Jesus and who love you. And then expect God to show up. Will you live with an anticipation and expecting that God will show up, God will do what you cannot do, and you can walk in confidence, not that everything's always easy, but that God's always on the throne. God, that's our prayer today. We're all facing tough circumstances, and some of them seem impossible. But Lord, we pray that you will lead us forward, and if you're calling us to go after something, to address it, to tackle something that seems undo it. We feel like there's a roadblock. We feel like that it's too big for us. Let us know that you are God and you're on the throne. And Lord, let us walk in your power and your strength. And then when you show up and do what we cannot do, we will give you the glory and the praise and the honor. We will lift up your name and we will tell the world, this God who I love, this God who I follow is a God who does the things that I could never do. And I partner with him and give him the glory and get the joy of walking on the journey with my God. Lord, let us walk in that strength and confidence, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, before I give you a word of blessing today and we wrap up our time together, I want to encourage you again, go to the Shoreline website and check out what's going on there. If you're not getting the Monday, Wednesday, Friday devotions, opt in for those and you'll be picking, we'll be sending those to you and let you know what's going on in the life of the church. If you need prayer, Please, right now, uh, call in on the number you see on the screen there. Uh, or or if, you do, if you want to have a prayer another time, just you know, email the church, contact the pastor. We're here for you. Our pastors are still working. We're still here for you. Give us a call. We want to talk to you. We want to pray with you. If you're new at Shoreline, uh, use, the, uh, use the email there at the info at Shoreline Church. And just send us a note and say, I'm new. And, and we want to just get to know you. We'll, 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 uh, we'll let you know what's happening in the life of the church. We'll answer any questions you have. We want to be there for you. And then after I give a word of blessing, I want to encourage you just to stay on for just a moment because we're going to have a short video highlighting some really important things that we want you to be aware of and I think you'll want to hear about. And so so after the word of blessing, stay on for just a moment. As we close our time together, may you walk into the rest of this week knowing that the God that you worship today, the God of Daniel, the God of the Old Testament, the God of the New Testament, the God of the church, the God who leads and guides Shoreline Church. That God is so glorious and so powerful and has authority, he's on the throne, that even when something seems insurmountable to you, if God's in it and he's leading you, keep following him because he can accomplish all the kind of things we can't, but he calls you and me to partner with him. So partner with God, watch him do the impossible, watch him do the, the, what you can't imagine and then give him the glory and walk in that strength. God bless you, and have a great week.